Hello, I'm Susan Flory, and this is my podcast, The Big Middle. This is where we explore the big issues around midlife, smashing some stereotypes and shifting some attitudes as we celebrate living healthy for longer. There is no doubt you'll find my guest beyond inspirational. Trisha Cusden is the founder of Look Fabulous Forever, a makeup brand changing the language of the beauty industry. Great to have you on The Big Middle, Trisha. It's a pleasure. Nice to be here. Now, pro-age is your corporate and your personal philosophy, Trisha, and it's mine too. It's the raison d'etre of this podcast. Take us back to four years ago. You were 65. You were frustrated. Tell us what happened. Well, I was uh, thinking to myself, I might live for another 20 or 30 years. Uh, What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And uh, I've always loved business. I've always loved makeup. And I really dislike the way that the beauty industry can only sell me anti-aging products as a 65-year-old as I was then. And um, those three things came together and made me think, I could do something about this. Why don't I take the beauty industry on? create a range of makeup specifically for older women and use completely different images, completely different language and talk about celebrating um, the aging process rather than being terrified of it. The insulting rhetoric about aging, it is endemic in advertising and on the cosmetic hall floor. We've got these dewy 22 year olds telling us 50 plusers what works best on mature skin. You've done the research, you've formulated things that are specific for older skin. What works? Well, the thing about an older skin is that it tends to be very thirsty. Uh, Features have changed, so your eyes are perhaps a different shape. Um, You might have lines around your mouth so that your lipstick feathers and bleeds. It's really about performance. Um, With our foundation, what you get is you get good coverage, but it stays feeling light on the skin and actually looking quite light. So it doesn't look heavy and mask-like, which is really important. A lot of older women hate that look, but it does the job of covering the blemishes and imperfections. So there are things going on uh, that that can be helped and corrected with makeup, which is what's so exciting about it. You've applied, I noticed on your website, FAB and FAF makeup ratings. (laughs) Do tell us about that. Well, that arose from, um, we were doing a makeover on somebody and she was quite reluctant to, uh, to wear makeup. And I said to her, you know, it really doesn't take very long and it's a very creative process. And she said, oh, it's an awful faff. Oh, I can't be bothered with all that. I can't be doing with all that, you know, that kind of attitude, which kind of annoyed me. So I wrote a blog post about it, giving makeup a faff or fab rating. And what I was trying to do there was to show, you know, how difficult it is to apply, so how much of a faff it is, but then how great the effect is. So you could have something that's uh, really easy to apply, so something like highlighter. Um, So that would be a faff rating of one, but a fab rating of, uh, you know, ten, because it makes your face look great. And at the end of the makeover, did you convert her? We did, to the extent that she looked in the mirror and said, wow, I look amazing. And I said to her, really? So you could see the benefit of wearing makeup then. And would you be prepared to spend somewhere in the region of five to ten minutes every morning just to create that effect? And she said, I think I would, yes. It's a tough one, going through the menopause, having your face slide, your hair frizz, anybody who has been through it. There's a certain element of mirror avoidance that goes on. Yeah. It's not about ridiculous fantasies about becoming our 24, 25-year-old selves. How do you address that? I think it's really important that we meet ourselves in the mirror and we don't shy away from it. I I think that's really important. And it's part of the reflection of society that says you are no longer beautiful, that's that's being played out by us in our avoidance of the mirror. And yet if you look in the mirror and you just make friends with that face... Uh, you can actually say, this is how I look now, and it's fine, it's perfectly okay. And that level of accepting yourself and accepting the changes that are happening in your body and saying, this is the next phase of my life. And you know what? The alternative is not to still be around, you know? Would you really rather not still be around than be around and look in the mirror and say, this is how I look right now? You count your blessings while you count your crow's feet lines. Aging is a privilege, not accorded to everyone. Absolutely. And there's lots and lots of help out there. We, we made you know, many, many video tutorials, which are really, really designed to take you by the hand and say, it's okay. You know, we'll show you how. Uh, you, you're not alone in this. Lots and lots of people out there t- going through the same process. 
and you don't have to struggle on alone. What do you say to those women who recoil at any artifice? Fair enough. I would say fair enough. I'm not. I'm not a one woman uh, campaigner to make all women wear makeup. You know, if you don't, if you choose not to, then that's absolutely fine by me. I would say that making a little bit of effort in the morning to look the very best that you can makes it certainly makes me feel better. I tend to think that it makes other people approach you in a different way. So that if you've got, uh, as say, you've made some level of effort, I think people respond to you differently. I love to hear stories of. Uh, women that are, you know that they're in hospital and they know they're getting better the moment that they want to put their lipstick back on you know it's Fantastic, a signifier yes. of health I think caring for yourself um, and the way that you appear to the world is a signifier of mental health in, in many ways yeah your self-esteem You're saying I matter and I matter enough to do this and to take the time to do it and uh, and that's how I'm, I'm living in the world yeah. yeah, I think the shock of, of menopause, at least for me, you look in the mirror and you think how I feel and how I look is out of sync suddenly. For me, it was addressing this social construct of what older should look like. Absolutely. Because, of course, yeah. inside, I'm 12 and a half. Yeah, exactly. I was actually at a conference on Thursday and there was a speaker about it. He's done a lot of research on this. And he said, if you talk to people in their 80s and 90s about feeling old, they'll say, I'm not old. Ask her, she's old, but I'm not old. In other words, it, it would appear that we never actually get to the point where we say, I am now old. That resides always somewhere else outside of ourselves. So that the internal sense of self really doesn't change. The external is changing all the time, but the internal isn't. And I think that's a very, very important lesson to learn. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's all about the inner dialogue you have and how you push away some of these social constructs yeah. and cliches yeah. that tend to invade the loop that we've got in our brains whenever we start to think about how we look. And you are someone who is an exemplar of finding your passion and taking it to a degree where we see that you are now an influencer. Hopefully. Let's let's yeah. go through that. Yeah. You rebranded, retrained as a makeup artist yes. after raising children and then a fulfilling career as a management training consultant. Yes. Tell us about the moment when you decided, okay, makeup is going to be my new thing. Yeah, well, it was that moment of what am I going to do with the rest of my life? But I also knew at the same time that I was putting together the, the brand, the makeup brand, that I wanted it to give me a voice to express the way that I feel about the ageist society in which we live, because I think it's very damaging, especially to women. It's more damage to women than it is to men. And I see that the effects of that damage all around uh, in, the, in the lowering of confidence, in the lowering of self-esteem in older women. And I just thought if I can find a way to speak up and speak out about this, wherever I can do it, in writing or in my say on, on platforms when I speak to audiences and actually say, do you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm actually just about to be 70. 70 is just a wonderful age to be and really mustn't start dreading it because it's great. What about people that haven't managed to maintain or get anywhere near that sweet spot of having some money in the bank, having a mortgage paid off, you know, having a bit of cash to splash on whatever their new passion is? Yeah. What do you say to them? You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're struggling with yeah, the basics. basics. Yeah. Never mind being self-actualized and finding new meaning yeah. and purpose. Yeah. What do you say to those women? I mean, they're not going to find it in a pot of lip balm. No, they're not. And, and I, I, I realize that that is a huge struggle for, for many women. And there are all sorts of, of gross um, unfairnesses in society. Uh, the, the pension age keeps moving up. But, you know, this, this, the reality of living a much longer life is hitting us in, in, in many ways, both uh, good and bad. The good thing is we are living longer. The bad thing is that, uh, unfortunately, society hasn't caught up yet with that with that process but to go back to your question what do you say to somebody who's still struggling um, I think it's really it is really tough but I would also say that um, the underpinning of things like self-confidence self-esteem feeling okay about yourself is a hugely important part of how you deal with that and how you cope with it because if you do feel very demoralized and very depressed then it's likely to you know to get you down even more they say that the sales of lipstick goes uh, go up in a recession. Yes. And I think there's no accident in that. No. So it's like 
if I can just afford to buy myself a lipstick, I can put that it's lipstick lift my on mood. and that will lift my mood and it will make me feel better. And I would say that, I would say it doesn't have to be major things. It could be a very tiny thing like lipstick being an act of defiance <laughs> yes. to yes. say, okay, you know, I, I'm not in a great place in my life right now, but I am going to put my lipstick on and I'm going to face the world uh, with, with a, a level of defiance. The framework that society, Western society has developed, employers are not employing older people. The retirement age is slipping forward yeah. every few years. We, they yeah. keep adjusting it upwards. They do, and they will keep adjusting it upwards. And too. yet there are people primal screaming on the forums online about aging and menopause and all of these issues because they can't find work. Yeah. After high-flying careers, they cannot find meaningful yeah. work because the model has not caught up with the reality yeah. of being healthy older yeah. in the current society. Absolutely. Well, there's, I mean, there's two ways that um, we are trying to do something about that. So uh, I need desperately needed a customer services manager a couple of years ago when we were deluged with orders uh, as a result of me being on breakfast television. And um, I had been networking with somebody who I knew had lost her job a couple of years before. She'd applied for 200. She was 58. She'd applied for 200 jobs and hadn't got a single interview. She was absolutely desperate in a really poor state. And I, I said, but she used our makeup. And uh, I rang her up and said, come and see me. And she, I said, I need you to start tomorrow. And she said, I can start tomorrow. Fantastic. And it took her about two days to learn the job because she's enormously competent. She's brilliant with the customers, knows exactly, exactly how to talk to them because she is our customer. And uh, I'm very proud to say that she's still working in the company. She's got quite a major role developing a second thing that we're doing, which is uh, we're calling Look Fabulous Forever at Home, which is an opportunity for older women to earn money by selling our makeup to groups of uh, their friends and... Um, and Tupperware, Avon. Exactly that idea, yeah. But we're keeping it fairly simple. We're not doing a pyramids uh, scheme. We're just Good. doing a straightforward... Um, you know, if you're into, it's not going to be earning a fortune, but it is at least something. And it's the qualification for doing it is that you're older. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fantastic. Wouldn't it be wonderful if across the board we could adopt that? Because I went through the same thing as your yeah. 58 year old. I couldn't get the interviews. Yeah. The algorithmic robots out there in recruitment land, they simply were not interested. And I had a lot of peripheral skills I wanted to apply in new directions. And they just overlook you. Even if you shave, as we all tend to do, some years off. If you're in your 50s, everyone I've spoken with has shaved years off their CV. Yeah. So they're looking about 45, 46. Yeah. They don't get a look in. You're not even invited to the interview. No, no that's exactly Caroline's experience. I mean, she, she adjusted her CV, so she wasn't putting in dates. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't letting them work out how old she was. They must have known from quite a long career that she was older rather than younger but it's such a waste of talent that's what makes me so angry about it and I feel that uh, here I am at you know 70 with a very long working life behind me and lots of skills and ability which I'm pulling together into the this role and do you find you're as I do I am incredibly decisive I know exactly what I want when I want it yeah. and you know not to fly in the face of good common sense if somebody says that's not going to work but you have an approach that works. Well, I have loads, loads, loads more confidence in every situation. You know, I do a lot of quite scary things. I recently talked to an audience of 3,000 people, and which would terrify most. Uh, would have terrified me when I was younger, but it doesn't terrify me anymore. And I just feel like, you know, uh, why would somebody write me off just because I'm a certain age? It's irrelevant. I think of you as being not only an inspirational figure, but a courageous one. You were frustrated, you spotted a niche, but you certainly didn't, I'm sure, expect that it was going to grow no. in all these many directions naturally. The beauty industry is a saturated, mature sector, and yet you sallied forth and you got not only your slice of it, but you're, you're morphing your brand in several different areas. Tell me about the kernel of activity and the slice of life that actually propelled you on your way. Well, it was a, a set of circumstances that I guess you could almost say was an existential crisis in the sense, and I think this does hit, hit a lot of people when they make quite brave decisions. Something happens, something stimulates that change. And uh, mine was a, a situation with my younger daughter, Susie, who was pregnant with her second child. 
and the baby was born prematurely just by a month but was very tiny and was very sick at birth so uh, over the period of the next three to four months I literally put my life on hold in order to help support my very distraught daughter and son-in-law to help look after Freya, the baby India's sister, and India herself, who was in hospital for nearly 10 months. And um, fortunately, she did survive, even though she wasn't expected to for, for some time. She's okay now? She's fine. She's, she has a rare chromosomal abnormality, which was causing all the health problems. And uh, she, uh, she, she had a very rocky start, a very rocky first two or three years. But she's nearly six now. And um, she's fantastic. She does have uh, limited uh, mental capacity. However, she is a delightful little girl and, uh, and has done remarkably well. And I suppose... The experience of, of helping to look after India and the family for a year putting my life on hold like that also being with a very sick baby who could have died at any moment makes you realize that life is very very precarious it causes you to reflect on yeah. many levels it makes you reflect on many levels being surrounded by sick children where they've got these machines beeping all the time is scary and uh, you know at the end of it we came out and breathed a big sigh of relief and thought, I, I, I was thinking, now what do I do? You know, and so I started the business, as, as, I, as, as I told you, because I really did feel like I couldn't waste any time. And from a business perspective, massively successful. Yes, yes, I'm delighted to say. We're now, we're now a very good team of nine people. My daughter is now our managing director. Uh, my other daughter, Susie, who's India, and uh, Freya's mum, she is our operations director, so it's a family affair which is lovely. And, and you've got other people on staff who yes. are over 50. Uh, yes. Not correct. just Caroline, yes, but Caroline, others. Julie, um, we, we haven't set out to specifically recruit older people, but they um, we love it when the, you know when they do apply for these jobs because we, we know they'll be a perfect fit. But Caroline in particular, who heads up our customer services d- department, um, I, I'm thrilled to say that she came on board and she always says that I saved her life, but I always say she saved my life because Wonderful. I really needed her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you're out there now, as I said before, I've I've given you that tag, influencer. Yeah. You're out there speaking at conferences. Yes. yes. And, you're sp- and are you getting any feedback from oh, he- employers who are in a position to actually yeah. start looking again yeah. at the over 50s? Yeah, I mean, I, get, I always get a fantastic response to audiences when I speak to them. They come up to me afterwards and they, t- they say oh you're so inspirational thank you so much and so on which is lovely we have a big joke I have a big joke with my daughter Anna who says how inspirational were you today (laughs) mum that's delightful somebody said to me the other day you were beyond inspirational oh that's great and this is something it comes from your heart yeah that's quite clear you didn't set out on a path I'm going to make loads of money oh Oh, and uh, the byproduct of that will be to make older women feel less Uh, invisible it's the other way around I, I didn't do this to, to make money. I, it sounds very complacent, but I, I was happily and comfortably retired. So what I did it for was to uh, to have a life, a more interesting life. And I did hope it would give me a platform. I did hope it would give me an opportunity to speak out against ageism in society, whether that is, it is in employment or also in just casual stuff that you see around you where you think that just is so wrong. I imagine when you get up in the morning, you're you're filled with vim and vigor and <laughs> ready to take on the day. Probably not like most humans every day, but you are doing what you want to do, which is the key to anything. I have enormous energy and um, excitement and enthusiasm. That's never changed. I've always been an enthusiastic person, and this is this is the thing that we were talking about. Things don't change inside. You're always the same person. But I am amazed at how much energy I've got for this. Uh, I really don't get tired and. I think I don't get tired because I love it. It's a passion. You're changing the storyline. You're changing the narrative for so many women. So I can see it's resonating. You found a community, you found an audience, and you also have something that can help. A lot of people feel better about themselves. At a time when, let's face it, there is a, a palpable loss normally, even if it's just a blip because some people sail through menopause and, you know, have a wonderful understanding partner and a beautiful, exciting job. But for a lot of people, there's that loss of psychological, emotional physiological momentum yeah. in their lives yeah absolutely and I, th- I think that's it I, I think the menopause the process of the menopause itself can be quite debilitating clearly but when you get through it 
when you actually have gone through those physiological changes and, and, and the adjustment that you need to make, actually you can get a very big new lease of life. You can get a second wind. And that I, I definitely feel that happens to a lot of women. This is they, what they say. They 60s great. is great. Yeah. 50s, bit of a trial. 50s, bit of a trial. And let's face it, in the 50s, there's quite a lot of things happening at home, often with, with your offspring if you have them, with perhaps your old, uh, aged parents if you have them. So the 50s can be challenging on a number of different levels. Empty nest. Yeah. yeah, all of that. But by the time you get into your 60s, you have a different relationship to a lot of things. And I think that then, like I did, you can start looking around for something that you might really, really want to do and have the energy to do it. How do you kick back? How do you chill out? Oh, um, I read a lot. I like being on my own. I'm a, I'm a great person for uh, withdrawing, uh, certainly at weekends. I'm very happy to spend time alone. I read a lot. I love the cinema, the theatre, um, things like that. So I, I have a very... A, 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 I, I'm very good in my own skin and with my own company. And I think that helps because I'm not always looking for external stimulus in that way. I don't have to have lots of people around me all the time. But you only had the same 24 hours that we all do. And you've now produced a beautiful book (laughs) about all of these issues that we're discussing. Yeah, I have. I loved writing the book. I enjoyed it. Was that a weekend effort? No, um, I committed about two to three days a week to that and the rest of the time to the business. Fortunately, as I said, um, Anna, my daughter, became managing director of the business around the time that I was uh, commissioned to write the book. So uh, they allowed me the time and the headspace to do it. And uh, I very, very much enjoy writing, which is a, a newfound pleasure for me. So... No, the book was was great. I, I enjoyed doing it very much. And uh, yeah, very excited about the book, in fact. It's a, it's a gorgeous tome, and I'm sure it's going to fly off the shelves. Yeah. Um, what wisdom do you think, if you roll back the years, would you share with, with you at 25? Me at 25? I can remember feeling very frustrated when I was 25. I was not long married, uh, just about to have my first child. And I had not done nearly enough to satisfy my ambitions in the world. And um, remember that the the timing for that, it it was the early 70s. This was just as the women's liberation movement was getting going. And I was reading books by Germaine Greer and Marilyn French and Gloria Steinem and those people who were talking about, you know, and and even Simone de Beauvoir, the second self, this this second sex, this whole idea that women were frustrated by their circumstances and by the sort of male patriarchy, if you want to put it that way. Very binary thinking on all levels. Exactly, and I really felt it very powerfully. And I just kept thinking, just bide your time. You can't do it now. Stay home, look after the children. That's that's what you will have to do, because I wanted them to have a good childhood. But when they were 9 and 12, um, and I had done a degree during that time as a mature student, I thought, now is my time, and I am going back to work, and I'm going to be successful in my own right. I really loved it. And, and the thing was that I felt like I felt a complete justification for taking that time to then build that career for myself. And, uh, and of course, I left my husband. So <laughs> a lot <laughs> happening, just a few things happening. <laughs> I decided during that period. I was 42 to, to leave the marriage because I just felt that uh, he and I had grown apart. And of course, by becoming successful in this new career, which I started at 38, I'd become financially independent and I could have a, a perfectly good life without him. And I thought, well, why would I stay? You know, I'm a great risk taker. I've, I've taken a lot of risks in my life and it was one of the risks I took. But I I, I actually didn't think about it for too long. Somebody asked me at the, this very weekend, have you ever regretted leaving your husband? And I, I said immediately, I've never had a second of regret uh, because it was absolutely the right thing. For me. Well, you know yourself. Absolutely. You're very yeah. self-aware. Yeah. And if it's not working for you, you change yeah. the picture. No, I needed I, I needed to get out from under that. And, and just to, as I said, my mentioned the word self-actualization. I, th- I think I could, I knew that I could do that better on my own. Let's remind people how they can connect with you. Yes, so the website is uh, thefabulousforever.com and we're also on uh, Facebook 
And your book? So the book, of course, yes. The title is? Uh, it's Living the Life More Fabulous, and we've called it a handbook in beauty, style, and empowerment for older women. Trisha Coston, founder and managing director of Look Fabulous Forever, Makeup for Older Women. Thank you so much for coming on The Big Middle. It's been an absolute pleasure, Susan. Delightful to talk to you. Relevant information, inspirational interviews about midlife, just like this one, every other week on The Big Middle with me, Susan Flory. We'll see you next time. <laughs>